ocean The purchase of blood To every believer The promise of God The vilest offender Who truly believes That moment from Jesus A pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord And certainly we do rejoice and we praise our God. To God be the glory for the great things he has done, for his love and his graciousness and his mercy to us. We're glad that you're here with us here at Harlandale Christian Church uh, to come together to, into this house of worship to fellowship and to worship the Lord and to praise him. And we thank you for those uh, to those who are gathered with us online because you're not able to share with us in the house of worship. We rejoice, we honor, we worship the Lord, even as the psalmist uh, reminds us in Psalm 119, verses 137 and 138, that he is good and that he is righteous. The psalmist says, you are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. God is righteous. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. He is worthy of our praise and our adoration. Let's go to him together in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can come together today and worship you uh, as we fellowship with each other. We uh, come and gather together to to sing these hymns, these songs that they bring honor and praise to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you also for the opportunity we have to, to fellowship with you, with each other as we gather at the communion table, the Lord's table, and to feed upon your word as we fellowship in the study of your word and your message for us. Thank you, Father, for being righteous. Thank you for being trustworthy. Thank you for uh, your grace and your mercy to us. We pray that you receive our worship and our adoration as we've come together to honor you and to thank you for your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. That 
bids our sorrow cease That bids our sorrow cease Tis music in the sinner's ears Tis life and health and peace Tis life and health and peace Tis life and health and peace
Well, each Lord's Day as we gather together for worship time, uh, we have the opportunity to participate in the Lord's Supper, to share in this communion time. We, uh, we prepare the bread, the unleavened bread, that represents the, the body, the flesh of Jesus Christ that, he, that was nailed to the cross of Calvary that he, when he gave himself as a sacrifice for your sins and mine. We have the cup, the fruit of the vine, uh, that reminds us of the blood that he freely shed, that he gave to wash our sins away, to make us white as snow. And we remember his love and his sacrifice. At this time, we'd also think that, you know, if you're like me, this time of year, we probably, all of us are getting some kind of uh, cheerful letter in the mail. It describes all the wonderful things your money is going to do. I'm not talking about all of the, th the, uh, the mailers because of the midterm elections and the local elections. Uh, uh, thinking about the ones that are, that are not a pitch for charitable contribution, but it's this delightful letter from your county tax assessor. Oh, you know, it's very convenient. They provide you with a handy form with all the relevant information on it. They even maybe provide an envelope that's pre-printed to avoid it being sent to the wrong address. Now, admittedly, it's pretty obvious that maybe they're a little too stingy to put a stamp on it. But they do include a part of the form that you can file away in your file cabinet. But the bottom line is still the same. It's a reminder of, of what you owe for your property taxes. You know, not all reminders come in an envelope. We are explicitly told that the communion time, this Lord's table, is a reminder. It's not all cheery like the tax collector's letter. In fact, this is rather somber. And it doesn't come with the form to fill out. Rather, it comes in the form of a ritual. As for records, God keeps them. You don't need to bother with that. The bottom line, however, is the same. This is a reminder. It's not a reminder of what you owe but it's a reminder of what Christ did for you and me. Let's just think about what he did for us this time as we come into this communion time. First, there's the incarnation. The God of the universe, he who spoke and the worlds began, he descended into the form of a baby. He was born in a stable to a couple living in a nation that was occupied by foreign invaders. He grew up just like we do. He knows what it was to be cold, to have his feet hurt, and most of all, to know the limits of the human body. Next, there's the atonement. Of his own free will, his choice, he went to the cross of Calvary to pay the price for your sins and mine. He suffered a horrible death. He bled and died all because of the love that he brought to us. And then finally, there is the resurrection. It's the great guarantee of our hope. Someday at his return, we'll rise from the grave. Today, as we partake of these emblems, I hope that you'll be reminded of the great sacrifices that he made for you, for me. Our communion song today is, At the Cross, Love Ran Red. I hope that you'll meditate upon the message of that song and upon the message of this remembrance and these emblems as we partake. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this privilege that we have of gathering and fellowshipping with you at this communion table. Thank you that Jesus instituted or participated in this Last Supper with his disciples 
just before he even went to the cross for them, for us. Thank you, Father, that this has been provided for us, the bread and the cup, to remind us that Jesus, you come in the flesh, lived this perfect, the, the perfect sinless life in the flesh that remind us that he provided the atonement the price paid to redeem us from our sins and he gives us that hope of his resurrection that when one day we too will be resurrected to spend eternity with you father help us remember that because of your love because of the love of your son jesus our savior i pray in jesus name Amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace
Well, think about how far you've already come in your walk and in your life with Jesus Christ. God wants to continue his transforming work by continuing to bless you and, and even to keep you on the altar, which is a basic principle that sometimes is just too uncomfortable for us to think about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessing, for your continued uh, grace and mercy that we have through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, the breath of life and your breath, your spirit, to live with us and in us. Lord, we thank you for your continued grace that you've poured into our lives. Today, I pray that you'll help us to respond courageously and consistently to that immeasurable gift, your grace, your salvation, as we give our lives as living sacrifices to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come to the last message in our sermon series on the book of Romans. As I mentioned uh, last week and, and maybe the week before, we could probably spend a whole year going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, but we've pulled out these five significant key points from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And we've talked through several key teachings and principles that stand out as some of the, the, the significant uh, things in life of a believer and in the health of the, of, the early, of the local church. We talked about the problem of sin. We talked about the rescue from sin that Jesus has performed for us. We talked about the pursuit of righteousness. And last Lord's Day, we, we studied how God chooses us. He chose us, and he's given his grace and his mercy to us uh, even before we were born. Today, as we come to the close of this series of study, I, I think we're going to explore one of the greatest principles that the Apostle Paul discusses in the book of Romans, becoming living sacrifices. And this is important because as we learn about sin, redemption, righteousness, and all of those key points, we're often left asking ourselves, and we, we often ask God, okay, so now what? Well, today is an answer. Not a full and exhaustive answer, but an answer to this question. Now what? I hope you turn with me to Romans chapter 12, and we'll get started by reading uh, Romans 12, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. So if you've probably noticed, Paul mentions the concept of a living sacrifice in this passage that we just read. Now, in the Old Testament, there were many sacrificial offerings made for, for lots of different reasons. And all of these sacrifices were obviously dead. But Paul decides to change the game a bit in this passage. He ups the ante. He calls us as believers in Jesus Christ to become living sacrifices. You know, this type of sacrificial living requires us to, to be always willing to crawl back onto that altar for sacrifice. 
Or as Jesus says, Who, uh, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me in Luke chapter 9. My friends, this won't always be comfortable and it, and it invites us to potential suffering. But overall, this is what God desires. But how do we do this? How do we become and effectively be this living sacrifice that, that Paul is talking about? Well, I think that Paul lays out a very simple guide for us in this short passage. He talks about the importance of saying no to the things of this world that require crawling off of the altar to experience while instead sacrificially saying yes to the things of God. And ultimately, when we do that, we'll begin to understand more of our role in God's purpose and God's plans. So the key points that we want to draw from, uh, from this passage, Paul makes clear to us. The first is, say no to the world. Paul invites us to simply say no to the patterns of this world. Now, I'm a firm believer that in everyone's life, there are cycles, there are rhythms of one form or another. Some of us have healthy rhythms. Maybe we wake up early each morning, drink our cup of coffee, spend some time in God's word and in prayer. And then we complete a, a morning workout or uh, or uh, another habit that we've built before going to work or school. Others of us, however, may find ourselves caught up in unhealthy cycles and rhythms. Think for a moment of a time in your life when you had an unhealthy rhythm. Maybe it was a sinful habit that you just kept coming back to over and over. Even though you knew that it was sin, even though you knew that it wasn't the right thing, that you still just would keep going back to it. And then I'd like for you to hone in on the fact that it trickled over into other areas of your life. When I've experienced this, I, I allowed the things of this world to lead me off the path, to lead me astray. I was stuck in a cycle that I didn't know if I could get out of. But I finally came to the conclusion that what God needed from me was a willingness to simply say no. And in your life right now, maybe the first step towards transformation for you is some internal dialogue, some conversation between you and that sinful habit. That conversation where you say, sin, you've been creeping back into my life every time I convince myself that you're done and that you're gone. And even if you continue to present yourself to me as a temptation, I'm telling you the answer right now is no. Now friends, you might remember back a few weeks ago when we dealt with the problem of sin and I shared with you Genesis 4, 7. Just as a refresher, that passage says, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do, if you do not do what is right, then sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Think about that. Sin wants you, but you must deny it. You know, many of us may have an unhealthy rhythm or cycle in our life right now because we've been, as Paul says, trying to copy the behavior and the customs of the world. When we have a rhythm in our life, we'll be, in some form or fashion, mirroring someone or something. Either we'll mirror the world and its values and its plans and purposes, or we'll mirror our God and His plans and purposes. So we have received the initial subtraction that must take place. We must say no to the purpose, the ways of the world. 
But what do we do when we subtract the ways of the world? What do we do to add in its place? Paul tells us, say yes to the way. Once you're able to identify those worldly patterns and cycles that you've been following, then space is created for God's transforming work, God's plan, God's purpose, and how that can take place in your life. You remember that Jesus modeled a life of, of humble sacrifice as he pursued restoration and the redemption of all of mankind. Well, in our Romans 12, verse, uh, chap chapter 12, verse 2, Paul seems to be uh, we're concerned with how we think because our thought process is important when it comes to our, uh, our potential for growth in the kingdom of God. Very often, the temptation to follow worldly patterns and values begins with a thought. Just a spark, a thought. But the same is true for the patterns that Christ wants in our lives. Just a spark of the Spirit of God and of Christ in our lives. Spending time reading and studying the Word of God will give us the right type of thought process, thinking and dwelling on his word. And it'll help us to respond well when we're confronted with these worldly things. And it's not something that we can turn to every now and again, or only on the bad days, or only when we really know that's, that we have faced something that is wrong, that something that is uh, worldly. It has to be a healthy routine, a healthy cycle, a healthy rhythm, if you will, that we enter into in our relationship with God. You'll be glad to know that the Bible talks about this very concept. In Psalm 1, 2, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, David says, Blessed is the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Now, King David is a walking, talking example of the importance of meditating on God's word day and night. That's the law that, he, that he's talking about in Psalms 1. He's not talking about just reading the law books and, and, and listening to what the law says. He's talking about reading and taking in and soaking up every word of God day and night. God wants us to have the word near us but more importantly, he wants us to have it in us, in our minds, in our hearts, and throughout our lives. You know, the work of becoming a living sacrifice is going to require our commitment like this. Maybe there's something you need to change in your morning or evening routine to allow God to transform you from the inside out by spending time with him, time in his word, time in prayer, time meditating upon him. First, you need to move worldly distractions out of the way and allow God to come and, and do a transforming work in your mind and in your heart. Paul closes out Romans 12 too, with an outcome once we take these steps toward sacrificial living. He says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Which gives us our third key point from this passage. We need to discern our purpose. You need to discern your purpose from God. You know, even though Paul wrote this letter many, many years ago, it's amazing how God knew what we would need even today in 2022. There are many who hear this today who've spent time searching tirelessly for their purpose in life. Maybe you tried to find it in the things of the world and figured out that you just couldn't. 
Maybe they made you happy and satisfied for a while and then something came up and you lost focus in it. You tried to find it uh, in, in a particular relationship and then you figured you couldn't. You tried to find it by achieving a certain social media status and then figured out you couldn't. Friends, Christ is the only one who can give you meaning and purpose in your life. He's called you to do great things for his kingdom here on earth. He's called each one of us who've accepted him as our Lord. He's called us to model our lives after his so that we can do great things for his kingdom. I wonder how many of us have yet to sense a calling from God because we've still allowed our unhealthy rhythms and cycles and habits to act as distractions, calling us off that altar. We haven't been able to sense God's leading because we haven't spent time with him. The good news is this. There is still time. There is still time right now to rewire your life. The Bible is full of instances where, where God makes it clear that there's still time to surrender yourself to him in sacrifice. Actually, the story that comes to mind is the one of the thief hanging on a cross next to Jesus at the crucifixion. In Luke 23, beginning with verse 39, we read Luke's account when he says of one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, if this, does, if this story doesn't convince you that there's still time to believe, still time to turn from sin and live a righteous life, then I'm not sure what will. I know that there are folks who, who, who say, oh, I still have time. I, I still have, uh, I want to I get what the Bible says is coming for me and to me through Jesus. But I want to live all of this life out. And then when it's close to that time when I will die, then I will give myself to Jesus. The problem is, with God, every moment matters. And we don't know when our last time, when our last moment will ever be. With God, he can use every moment of your life up to and out from this exact point today. But if you want to know Christ and you want to understand your call, you need to choose him above everything else every single day. And then... As Paul says, then you will learn to know God's will for you. Joel, in the Old Testament, Joel 2, verse 12 says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Now, this seems to be going all the way back to the book of Genesis. This seems to be the Lord's heart for his creation that mankind would willingly choose to return to him, to forsake all of the idols, to turn from all the sin, to eliminate all the distractions, and simply return to relationship with him. But we didn't do it. We haven't done it on our own. And so we have Jesus. Jesus the Christ came to this very earth. He was tempted by the same worldly things that you and I are tempted by. And yet he did not sin. Ultimately, Jesus the Christ was nailed to a cross for our sins 
so that we could be transformed into walking, talking reflections of Jesus. And this is a good, as good a day as any to respond with sincerity to this specific outpouring of the grace of God. You need to identify the areas of sin and distraction in your life, the areas where the world is influencing you and taking control. You need to pursue righteousness, redemption, and reconciliation. Reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ and reconciliation with, fellow, with your fellow man, whether it's your, your family, a neighbor, a co-worker. And then as Paul says in Romans 12, you need to offer yourself as a living sacrifice day in and day out. Sacrificing the things of this world on that altar to live with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole being, living, modeling Jesus Christ. Friends, there, there is no one who's too far gone, and there's no offering too small or large. Just give the Lord a minute, an hour, or a lifetime. And he will use it to the fullest extent for his glory. And as Paul says in Romans chapter 16, as he concludes this letter to the church in, in, in Rome, he says, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message proclaimed about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the, command, by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our passage, our points today, Remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you, for me, to redeem us from the ways of this world, to redeem us from sin. They, they remind us that we have to commit ourselves and give ourselves to the Lord and let just say no to the worldly ways, say yes to the way of Christ, and discern and follow God's purpose and God's plan. Our hymn of decision and dedication today is, Thank you, Lord, for saving me. That's what this is all about. The salvation that God has given, has offered to, to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Then we become living sacrifices. Sacrificed away from the world dedicated to him will you live that sacrificial life and honor and give yourself to him and honor him let's pray father in heaven we thank you for the word that the apostle paul wrote to the church in rome because through your inspiration through your spirit that word was written to each of us even today thousands of years later. Thank you, Father, for saving us through your Son, Jesus Christ, when we accept him as Lord, as Master, as Lord of our lives. Help us, Father, to give up the things of this world, to say no to Satan, to say yes to you, to your Son, to your Spirit, and then to study your word and, and, and know your purpose and your plan. Most of all, Father, thank you for saving us through your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. my 
sin and shame.